Please turn in your Bibles to um, John chapter 5. We're going to finish up uh, 5 and dive into 6 this week. As we go through the Gospel of John, I've told you before that all the other Gospels were written, and John is trying to clarify Jesus to a world who's losing focus who he is. And Jesus is not a value-added thing. You don't add Jesus onto your life to make your life better. You don't add as much Jesus as you need to get your plans to come true. Jesus is here to give us life and life abundant and to bless us in the eternal and to bless us in the things that really matter. So as we look at the people he's talking to, the people he's talking to, and oftentimes the readers can't, put Jesus in the mold that they want him. And it really frustrates people when that happens. And as we go on here, we're going to see that Bible people are not exempt from this. That it was Bible people and people the most versed in the Bible that had the biggest problems with Jesus. Because you can be so steeped in the Bible yet miss Christ, which is a hard thing to imagine. Last week, I would like to clarify something. Last week, I was very, um, I, I re-listened to all my, all my teachings to make sure that I'm not being a jerk. I thought I was a little bit of a jerk, um, <laughs> a little bit scoldy in my tone, and I don't want to be. I, I want you to know that um, I, I said the thing about, about Republican, Democrat, non-political. And I want you to know that if you're a Republican, 100%, that may close some doors to you, but might open some doors to you also, or Democrat, or Independent. That's something for each one of you to decide. I don't want to dictate your relationship with God or your political affiliation or anything else for that matter. My goal in, in speaking about politics was to demonstrate and to show you that whatever decision you make affects something in the kingdom of God. And for us all to be very aware that when we make a decision, it does open and close doors. So every single decision you make should be in the light of eternity and what's best for the kingdom of God. So I just wanted to do a little house cleaning there in that respect because I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to ram on people who are politically active. God's called some of us to be extremely politically active. I mean, so much so that some Christians are senators, believe it or not. <laughs> That's a joke. No. <laughs> They're not really. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, God calls each one of us to do what we're supposed to do for him. And, so, and, and I don't want to regulate your, your liberty, your Christian liberty in that respect, or to lay some guilt trip on you that doesn't belong there. I just want us to be mindful of the decisions that we make. Um, when Jesus was last speaking, he had, he had healed the man who had been crippled for life. But he did it on the wrong day, <laughs> according to the religious people. Um, and and the, so they gave the guy a hard time and said, why are you carrying your mat, you know, that you were crippled on for all those years? It's the Sabbath. And, and the guy said, the guy who healed me told me to carry it, so I think I'll be carrying it. Thank you. Um, and so they come to Jesus and say, said to him, you did the wrong thing. You healed on the wrong day. And Jesus said, well... I know that offends you, but I'm going to offend you even worse. He says, I do what the Father does. I, I, what, what I see him doing, I do. He also um, is very clear that he's not going to only heal people, he's going to raise people from the dead. He says the authority, he said, I raise people from the dead whoever I want to. And then he says, and the same respect that you give God the Father, you should give to me. This just blew them away. They're like, what in the world is this guy saying? And he says, if you don't respect me that way, you don't respect the Father. So they're completely scandalized by that. And then when that, that brings us to chapter 5, verse 24. He says, I assure you, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, for they've already passed from death to life. This is one of the strongest salvation verses in the Bible. 
because he says they will never be condemned. If you're in Christ, brother and sister, you're never going to be condemned. And you're not going to someday pass into eternal life. You've already passed into eternal life. Eternity is now. When you are saved, from that point on, you have eternal life. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Because a lot of times we try to think of Christianity and our eternal life starting after we die. No, I don't have to worry about death. I'm living for a different kingdom. I'm living for a different system now. So you can just circle this in your Bible like, wow. I I will never be condemned. and I've already passed from death into life. And I assure you that the time is coming. In fact, it is here where the dead will hear my voice. And the voice of God and those who listen will live. The Father has life in himself, and he has granted his Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge all mankind because he is the Son of Man. Don't be so so surprised. Indeed, the time is coming when all the dead in their graves will hear the voice of God's Son, and they will rise again. Those who have done good will rise to eternal life, and those who have continued in evil will will rise to judgment. But I do nothing without consulting the Father. I judge as I am told, and my judgment is absolutely just because it is according to the will of God who sent me. It is not merely my own. He's saying, my decisions are God's decisions. Do you see how he keeps doubling down on this? God and I are one. And this is the thing that bothers them. They keep referring back to him as we go through John about healing on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath. But it's when he healed on the Sabbath what he backed it up with, saying, I get to do what I want because I'm God. And that just really rubbed them the wrong way. Now, he says here, he says, when I judge, that there's something that could be a little confusing here. It says, and they will rise again. Those who have done good to eternal life and those who have continued in evil will rise to judgment. So that could give rise to the idea that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. And if you're a bad person, you'll go to hell. And that's a very common thing, isn't it? That's what most people learn in church. Like you do good things, you do bad things, and if you're good, if it outweighs your bad, then you'll tip the scales, and then you go to heaven, right? Wrong. (laughs) That's not right. And you're like, but isn't that what the Bible says here? If you do good. But I want you to know, we're getting ready to go over to it, but I'll just jump ahead real quick here. It's in chapter 6, and we're going to get there. It says, the people said, what does God want us to do? In chapter 6, verse 28. In other words, in the King James Version, it says, what do we do to do the works of God? And then in verse 29, it says, Jesus told them, This is what God wants you to do, to believe in the one who he sent. To believe in the one who he sent. That's the good work. What good works should we do? He said the good work is to believe in the one who he sent. That's all Christianity is based on. That's what your salvation is based on. Have you accepted Christ or not? If it's anything else, if it's anything else, then it's Jesus died on the cross And I quit smoking. Jesus died on the cross, and I give my money. Do you see how that cheapens the cross? And sometimes when I just preach Jesus only, Jesus only, Jesus only, people go, well, that's cheap grace. I'm like, no, that's not. That's the most kind of premium grace you can get, where that covers everything. The cross of Christ covers everything. Anything that I need to, any grace that you need to add to, that's cheap grace. Because I've got to prop it up with something. My continued obedience to God. Whether, and this is a debate that rages through the church. Some people believe in you can lose your salvation. And I didn't grow up in that, in that doctrine. And some people believe, but I grew up in, <laughs> in a church where it wasn't that. It was something similar. It's called, well, if you're, do, if you're struggling with that in your life, obviously you were never saved. 
each one of those things, each one of those depend on one thing and one thing only. What? Your performance. <laughs> what you did. The cross of Christ is it. That is the only thing that you'll be judged for as far as salvation goes. And they say, well, where do, where do works fit in there? Are we supposed to work? Well, yes, we are. No doubt about it. But you can't get the cart before the horse. You can't, you can't add to the cross of Christ for salvation. The best passage I know of this is in Ephesians chapter 2. So if you want to turn there real quick, it nails it down for me as well as it can be. And I'll just say this. It's debatable. I've heard people argue this for eons, and it was going on centuries before I was born, these debates. But the Bible, I believe, is clear. When Jesus says in chapter 6, you know, <laughs> what does God want you to do? What are the works of God? Well, the work of God is to believe in the one who he sent. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 4, it says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so very much, that even while we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. So when I was dead, he did the work to make me alive. He says, it is only by God's special favor that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and we are seated with him in heavenly realms. You know what we are seated with him in heavenly realms mean? I'm already there. He's already redeemed me and already saved me, and I'm already perfect and sitting in heaven. I go, well, I don't feel that way. <laughs> I feel like I'm right here right now, struggling with sin in my life sometimes, falling short. But that's not how God sees me, because he sees it as a completed work. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. It's finished. The work's done. That work's been done. I'm counting on his work not my works. So let's continue to read. It says, all because we are one with Jesus Christ, in verse 7, and so God can always point to us as examples of the incredible wealth of his favor and kindness towards us as shown in all that he's done for us through Christ Jesus. In all the ages to come, we are a trophy of his grace. Did you know that? That in all the ages to come of all the beings that have ever lived, he can look on the shelf and go, see those Christians? That's a picture. They're trophies of my grace. Now, it, doesn't that sound special? Like, I'm a trophy of God's grace. I am a trophy of God's grace. Well, it sounds good, but let me explain it to you. So that it doesn't sound so good. <laughs> if you said, what is the one person that you could point to that points out what a gracious person Rich Sutliff is? You would pick out the person that's done the most wrong to me, but I still accept them. Right? Wouldn't you say, this person stabbed Rich in the back? This person tried to undermine Rich in every way? This person talked down to Rich? Was an enemy of Rich? And Rich still loves him. That would be a trophy of my grace. I'd be like, you know how gracious I am? Look at this jerk. <laughs> Look at this piece of work. And I still love him. And I still accept him. And I still want to be friends with him. I still, that's a trophy of my grace. That's what I am to God. Did you know that? That through all eternity to be like, oh, I'm not gracious? Look at Rich. I'm a trophy of God's grace that through all ages he can point to me and go, you see, that's his church. Not because we're, it's not, all, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. He tells his disciples at some point, he goes, unless your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't see the kingdom of God. And they go, pfft. Well, then who can go? Because nobody could exceed their righteousness. 
what's the only way to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? If I said, the righteousness of Jesus, and I'm in him. The only question is Jesus Christ, not the sins you've committed. That's why it's so simple. But for those of us who are self-righteous, I've done all this stuff. You know, I've done a lot of things for God. And then I didn't do all these other horrible things. I mean, I've been missing out for what? See how we look at sin sometimes? Like sin is like, that's fun. Let's go do that. And if I keep myself away from that, I should get a prize. And that's not the way sin is. Sin's like razor blades. Look at all those razor blades I didn't play with. Well, good for you. (laughs) God tries to keep us away from sin and the harmful things. We're like, no. So look at sin. When people are in sin, look at it as in they're hurting themselves. That's how God looks at it. It makes God sad when people sin. And he does whatever he can to fix that sin. So... The last two verses I have to read, it says in Ephesians 2, and 8 and 9, it says, God saved you by his special favor when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done. So none of you can boast about it. Now here comes works. For you are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that you can do good things he planned for you long ago. When you know who you are in God and you're securely planted in his love, you can bloom. You can grow. You can, the overflow of your life is the works that God wants. That's why, like, if you give your money, you give out of a hilarious heart. If you're not to the point yet where God has not grown you to the point where you want to give out of a hilarious heart, keep it in your pocket, for goodness sakes. It's not doing anybody any good, and God's not broke. If you make yourself come to church, stay home. Till you miss it. Till you go, I'm missing out. I want to be there. When I don't go, I miss it. That's what church should be. Now, do I do things out of obligation? No, I do things because sometimes I just, I realize, like, do I eat vegetables? Yes. Is it because I like vegetables? No, it's because my wife makes me. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) She's not here, so. She's been gone. Guess how many vegetables I've eaten? (laughs) Zero. I can already feel my health fading fast, though. (laughs) If she left me to myself, I would have to be like, I better eat some vegetables. Why? Because they're good for me. You do things sometimes not out of obligation, not because it will make me a better Christian or God will love me more. It's because, you know, when I'm there, I know I'm supposed to be there, and it blesses my soul, and it makes me feel good. So sometimes I do things I don't feel like. I joke sometimes. People are like, I didn't feel like going to the church today. I'm like, neither did I. (laughs) You know? (laughs) But somehow it wouldn't be the same if I didn't show up, you know? (laughs) So do what you do because it blesses you, because you know it's good for you, not because you think you're going to be better off in God's eyes or God's going to love you more. You're going to stay saved. You're going to prove that you really were. Because that's garbage. Because it's all works-based salvation. It's performance-based salvation. It has nothing to do with grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. So, where was I? Oh, verse 31. If I were to testify on on my own behalf, my testimony would not be valid. But someone else is also testifying about me. And I can assure you that everything he says about me is true. In fact, you sent messengers to listen to John the Baptist, and he preached the truth. But the best testimony about me is not from a man, though I have reminded you about John's testimony so that you might be saved. John shone brightly for a while, and you benefited and rejoiced. But I have a greater witness than John, my teachings and my miracles. They have been assigned to me by the Father, and they testify 
that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself has also testified about me. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe the one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you believe that they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. You refuse to come to me so that I can give you this eternal life. So what he's doing is he's saying, I am who I say that I am. But you know what? It's not enough that I just testify of myself. He said, there's other people who've testified to me. John the Baptist. You recognize him? He said I was the Christ. Okay, that's not enough. What about my miracles? What about my teachings? Okay, when I was baptized, the Father from heaven testified of me. He said, but more importantly than any of that, the scriptures point to me. And they were wrapping themselves in scriptures thinking that's what kept them safe. They had their religiosity and their religious systems down, and so they thought that by scriptures, think of this for a minute. Jesus Christ is perfection. He is a walking, talking scripture. He says, the word became flesh and dwelled among us. So he is the Bible personified, walking and talking. And what did they say about him according to their rules? He's a Sabbath breaker. He's a wine bibber. He's a glutton. He, his disciples don't wash their hands the right way. They, they break the Sabbath in several different ways. They had Jesus pegged for a sinner according to their standards and their idea in, in, of the Scripture. Dead to rights. Plus, they had him on blasphemy. He claimed to be God. Right? So according to their religious system, Jesus was as guilty as could be. And what was their system based on? The Bible as they knew it. Did you know you can hold a Bible in your hand, walk around knowing Bible verses like crazy, have a religious system, and not even know who Jesus is? And if someone who tells you who Jesus is or what salvation is, you can be like, I don't think so. Sounds like heresy to me. That's crazy, isn't it? That's the whole idea of fitting Jesus into your idea of what you want, want Jesus to be. Always be willing and always be ready for Jesus to occupy his space and for you to stop reining him in what you think his space is. Jesus is the Lord of our lives. That means he gets everything. You can say, no, not, not this part. I've seen people do that. They'll wall off their finances or they'll wall off their relationships. They'll wall off different parts of their life to their detriment. Because you know what? I'm going to give you a clue. Jesus does everything better than you. Oftentimes we wreck it, we break it, then we go, okay, you can have it. <laughs> I broke my marriage. Here, God. Wow, you do really good work. I broke my finances. I surrender, Lord. Here's my finances. Wow, you do finances well, too. He does everything better than you. Give it up to Jesus. You're not giving anything up. You're surrendering something to him, and he's going to make it better. He says, your approval or disapproval means nothing to me, because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you representing my Father, and you refuse to welcome me, even though you have readily accept others who represent only themselves. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from God alone. Yes, it is not I who will accuse you of this before the Father. Moses will accuse you. Yes, Moses, on whom you set your hopes. But if you'd believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. And since you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe what I say? He said, you've wrapped yourselves in this law, this scripture, Moses is your boss. He says, don't worry, on judgment day, I won't accuse you, Moses will. Because Moses spoke of me. And if you believe me, then you'd believe Moses. If you believe Moses, you'd believe me. But since you won't believe me, Moses will be doing the accusing. 
So, chapter 6, verse 1 says, After this, Jesus crossed over the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. And a huge crowd kept following him wherever he went. Why? Because they saw his miracles as he healed the sick. And Jesus went up into the hills and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the annual Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a crowd of people climbing the hill looking for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Philip, where can we buy bread to feed these people? He was testing Philip, for, for he already knew what he was going to do. Now, the other, this, is, this story of the feeding of the 5,000 is in every gospel. And the other gospels tell us that Jesus had sent his disciples out to do ministry, and they'd just come back. And so he wanted a report from them all. So he was trying to get away from the crowds. Also, we know that John the Baptist had just been beheaded, and Jesus wanted to get away from, for himself. So he wants to get away by himself, and he also wants to get away with his disciples. And here comes the crowd. The Bible says he was moved with compassion towards them. So it's Christ-like to put your need to visit with your friends, or your need for alone time, to put that below the need of the crowd. Sometimes the crowd needs you. It's not that he didn't aim to be alone, because he did. He got alone with the disciples, and he also got alone by himself. So you can aim that way, but if God brings a crowd to you, God brings interruptions into your life, your disappointments are his appointments. Sometimes you'd be like, this is not the way I planned my day. And God goes, oh, <laughs> that's because my plans are different than yours. <laughs> are you open to me changing your plans? Because we really like our plans, don't we? And if we get late or we get off track or whatever, we get really rattled. Some of you don't. Some of you go with the flow. But some of you are not. It's like, nope, this is my schedule, my time, my... But God makes interruptions. They're blessed appointments. They're God's interruptions. He was moved with compassion on this crowd, even though the crowd was just following him because of the miracles. Now he asked this question, he says, where are we going to get enough bread for all this? Because he knew what he was going to do. Philip says, you know, we have 200 denarii, or like 200 denarii wouldn't even buy enough for all of them to just have a, a snack. So he's like, we're not capable that's what Jesus is trying to bring him to. When God asks you sometimes, what are we going to do? You're like, I got nothing. He's like, okay, what do you need? I need you. <laughs> yep. He's trying to bring you into the awareness that you need him. He's showing you your need by asking you the question. So he tells him, he says, then Andrew, Philip replied, it would take a small fortune to feed them, in verse 7. In verse 8, then Simon, Peter, Simon Peter's brother spoke up, Andrew, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fishes, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus ordered. So all of them, the men alone, numbered 5,000, sat down on a grassy slope. Then Jesus took the loaves gave thanks to God, and passed them out to the people. Afterward, he did the same thing with the fish. And they all ate till they were full. Now gather the leftovers, Jesus told his disciples, so that nothing is wasted. There were only five loaves, only five barley loaves to start with, but the twelve baskets were filled with the pieces of bread the people did not eat. When the people saw this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is a prophet, the prophet we've been expecting. Jesus saw that they were ready to take him and force him to make, them, make him their king. So he went higher into the hills alone. Some things you'll notice here is that God uses what the little boy has. You can say, I don't have, I don't have enough or I don't have what I need. Just give God what you have. He'll make it work. It's his job to make it work. It's your job to be obedient and say, here's what I got. So 
five barley loaves, that was little loaves of bread, like little biscuits. And then the fish, the word for fish here is like two small fish. But in God's hands, that's everything. The other thing is, is they ate till they were full. Now, the other day, I was over at the castle's house. I don't know if you know them or not, but they had crappie fillets. And they had a bunch of them. And I, I feel embarrassed how much I ate because they were just too good and they put the plate right in front of me. And, <laughs> and I thought of that when I was reading this because they ate till they were full. They ate till however many they wanted, and it was the best. Jesus makes the best, and what he supplies is enough. He isn't skimpy. He's not just enough. Exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ask or hope for, is the plan that God has for us. And then there was leftovers. But you know what they did with the leftovers? Like, ah, forget it, it's just leftovers. No, he said, gather it up, don't waste it. Even if God gives you too much, don't waste it. Don't waste what God gives you. The other thing is, like, this is the prophet that we're expecting. Let's make him our king. Why do they want to make Jesus their king? Because they want a kingdom. Because they want their country to be restored again. And he went, it's not that kind of kingdom. It's not that kind of kingdom. Stop it. It's not that kind of kingdom. It says in verse 16, it, in the other gospels it said, he made his disciples get up on a boat, then he went up in the hillside alone. He made them get in a boat, and then he went up by himself. And I imagine he went up by himself because John the Baptist had just been beheaded. And he probably wanted to process that. We think of God, you know, Jesus as being God, so he doesn't need to process things, or he doesn't need time alone, or he doesn't need to pray. But he prays, and he processes, and he grieves. If you don't think that God grieves, <laughs> it's right in the Bible, at a, at a at a funeral, it says Jesus wept. Why? For the person who died? No, for the people who are left living, for the pain and the sorrow. He cares about, he cares about so much about people's pain. It says, all of our teardrops, your tears are kept in a bottle somewhere. Did you know that? That's in the Bible, that God keeps your tears in a bottle. That's a precious thing, isn't it? He cares about it more than I do. I've never kept all my tears in the bottle. <laughs> be a really small bottle. <laughs> we always joke around. I got my tear ducts removed when I got married. <laughs> Actually, when I became a man. <laughs> Just kidding. That's a joke. That's a joke, kind of. <laughs> but he went up by himself, and it says that evening he put his disciples in a boat. In verse 16, it says... That evening, the disciples went down to the shore to wait for him, which is funny because he didn't tell them to wait for him. He says, Get, go, go. He sent them away. But they said, well, we'll wait for him. They got tired of waiting. But as darkness fell and Jesus still hadn't come back, they got into the boat and headed out across the lake towards Capernaum. Soon a gale swept down upon them, and as they rowed, the sea grew very rough. They were three or four miles out when suddenly they saw Jesus walking on the water toward the boat. They were terrified, but, because, but he called out to them, I am here, don't be afraid. Then they were eager to let him in, and immediately the boat arrived at their destination. Now, it's an interesting story. Why would Jesus put them in a boat knowing there was going to be a storm? What kind of a cruel joke is that? It sounds like a joke that me and my buddies would play on each other when we were younger. You know, you'd do something that you knew intentionally would put the other person in jeopardy just for giggles, just for fun. That's not God's style. He doesn't like to cruel, you know, do things cruel to us just so he can get a laugh off of us. We're not God's joke. But why does he put us in stormy waters? You think God's ever put you in stormy waters on purpose? <laughs> Some of you got in stormy waters all by yourself. <laughs> but I know that you can be walking perfectly down God's path 100% where he wants you and end up in stormy waters. 
but he does that to build our faith, to help us to re- realize that we need him in the boat with us. When he's in the boat, what happened? They calmed the sea, and they were immediately at their destination. Isn't that crazy? Because Jesus is their destination. When Jesus is in your boat, you arrived. You've arrived when Jesus is in your boat with you. You're immediately where you're supposed to be. And that's the, I mean, this story could, I mean, this is where also Peter walked on the water also. I'm not going to go there because we'll get there in a different gospel. It says, the next morning, back across the lake, crowds began gathering on the shore, waiting to see Jesus. For they knew that he and his disciples had come over together, and the disciples had gone off in their boat, leaving him behind. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread, and the people had eaten. When the crowd saw that Jesus wasn't there, nor his disciples, they got into their boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. When they arrived, they found him, and they asked him, Teacher, how did you get here? Jesus replied, The truth is, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you saw the miraculous sign. But you shouldn't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that I, the Son of Man, can give you. For God the Father has sent me for that very purpose. And they replied, What does God want us to do? Jesus told them, This is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one who he sent. So he is, again, pushing the thing of believe in me. That's what I want you to do, is believe in me. That's what the Father wants you to do, is believe in me. Stop with the what can you do for me, Jesus thing. Because that's what they were doing. They were, they were looking for another meal. They were looking, do you have anything better than a meal? Do you have something, you know, maybe some money? Maybe some, can you tell me my future? Can you, they want something from Jesus. And the question is, do you come to Jesus wanting something? Or do you come to Jesus for Jesus? What do you get from following Jesus? What do you expect from following Jesus? The only thing you can expect or that you should want is Jesus himself, because Christ is enough. He says to us in the Bible, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, as we come into the service today, I would say, is your yoke easy and is your burden light? How are you doing? Does it feel like all that? Like, is Jesus enough? You're like, well, yeah, but there's this whole political thing going on. There's this whole religious thing going on. There's this whole social thing going on. This whole financial thing going on. There's a lot of things going on, isn't there? The question is, how much time are you spending on these things? I'm going I'm to give you a slogan. This is my new slogan. It's called Give God Equal Time. Give God equal time. You would think you'd say, well, make God number one or give God more time. No, give God equal time. If you spend two hours absorbing news, I want you to spend two hours absorbing the Bible. If you spend two hours on entertainment, I want you to spend two hours praying. Now, some of you can do two things at once. You can do your favorite hobby and listen to the Bible at the same time. So I'm not against cheating. (laughs) That would be what we call neutral time. If you're in your bow stand, it's not that time of year, but if you're ice fishing and you're listening to the Bible at the same time, That's neutral time, right? When you're sleeping, you don't count that time at all. You got to work, so you don't have to count that. I'm just talking about your spare time. Whatever you spend your time on, that will grow. That That will control you. Did you know that? 
I'll never forget. My, li- my life was transformed when somebody says to me, they said, whatever you spend most of your time doing, that's your God. I went, hmm, well, I don't know if I agree with that or not. Because I wasn't, I didn't want, I wouldn't even tell you what I was doing with my time. <laughs> so he said, throw away, throw away your sleeping time. Throw away your work time. I'm talking about time that you can do whatever you want to with. Show me what's number one on the list. I'll show you who you're serving. I'll show you who your God is. I went, hmm. So I, I started, I took my pen down. I'll take this challenge. And I started racking up time that I could do whatever I wanted to by reading the Bible, going to church. I'd come early and stay late because I'm that way. I'm like, oh, let's see. I came 10 minutes early, 10 minutes late. Now I get to do what I want to for that long a time. When I gave God, I said, I'm going to give God at least one more minute per day than I give myself. My life blew up in a good way. Because God has changed my DNA. I'm a different person. But I was like spending 90% of my time doing what I wanted to do, and I was giving God maybe 10%, and I was still doing okay. I was struggling. And I remember someone saying to me, or listening, hearing this thing about, well, you know, I don't, I don't struggle with that. And I'm like, well, of course you don't struggle with it. You're not in the same place as I am. Where, where I'm at, you, if you were living in my life, if I walked you to, down to the path of my life, you'd have a lot more struggles. And I went, wait a second. <laughs> I guess I'm making my life out where I struggle more. Maybe I should change the path of my life. Maybe I should be like, oh, that, that makes me struggle. I'll stop going there. I'll stop doing that. Whatever's got you bunged up this morning, whatever's got you, like, really troubled, I would suspect that you've probably been feeding that. You've probably been spending time with that. And I would guess you've been spending more time with that than you have with the Word of God. More time with that than you have in prayer. It's easy to sit and talk about a problem for a long time. But if you pray about a problem... That's different. If you're filling your life with the Word of God, that's different. I say give God equal time. See what happens. Pick the thing in your life that's bugging you the most, that you're spending the most time with, and write it down. How long am I? And read the Bible. Pray. Hang out with other Christians. Fellowship. And I guarantee you, if you give God equal time, He will come out on top. No doubt in my mind. I mean... I'll be cynical here with you a little bit. You could do an experiment and see how little you can give God and still not struggle. I'm that pragmatic of a person. I know that if you give, give God equal time, it works. And I, I don't want to play that. I don't want to experiment with that game. Like, well, how little time can I give God? Because he, he might catch on to that. He might not like that. <laughs> he might say, we need another lesson for you, young man. But give God his due. Give him his time. Because a lot of times we go, how little can I give and still make it out? Or can I just add enough Jesus into my life to make my life work? In verse 30 it says, they replied, you must show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. He had just fed them all. He'd fed 15,000 people with a pittance of food. They're going, show us a miracle, then we'll believe in you. What they were saying was, give us something more You're going to have to do more than that for us to follow you. That's what they're saying. You haven't won us over yet. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. As the scriptures say, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. So they're saying, can you do better than Moses? They got bread every day, not just one time, Jesus. So if you want us to switch from Moses to you, you're going to up the ante a little bit. Better give me a $2,000 stimulus check. (laughs) Did I I say that out loud? I'm sorry. (sighs) No, you got to do something. Give me, show me the money, you know. And he says to them, 
I assure you, Moses didn't give them bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. True bread of God is, is the one who comes down from heaven and who gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day of our lives. Jesus replied, I'm the bread of life. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry again. Those in, who believe in me will never thirst. So he said, if you come to me, you're never going to hunger or thirst. What does he mean by that statement? What I was just talking about. You will be content and you'll be full of peace. And I maintain to you that if, if you're not, it's because you're not using him in the proper way. The bread of life. The water of life. The Lord is perfect and gives me everything I need. He says, give us this day our daily bread. He gives me everything I need. He's, he's got a full meal for me there. Perfect platter, just oh, all the stuff I need. But sometimes I come in, I'm like, I don't want any of that. Now, can you imagine me walking into a place and there's a nice platter of food there? What would prevent me from eating it? Like, that's really good, but Rich doesn't want to eat it. Well, probably because I stopped off at Quick Trip. I went through McDonald's, had a you know big burger and a shake or whatever. Might be the best food ever that my wife's got on the table, but I'm like, could take it or leave it because I filled up with something else. A lot of times we fill our lives up with other things so that when it comes to the things of God, we're like, eh, I don't know. But the other things are making us sick, and God has the perfect plan for us. So if your diet of what you're putting into your life is making you feel sick or making you have a lack of peace or a lack of joy or a lack of victory, change your diet. Starve those things off. At least give God equal time. You can get by with eating a lot of junk food if your wife gives you vegetables. (laughs) Living proof right here. (laughs) No, you you can get by with doing some things wrong in your life. I had a drill sergeant that could outrun all of us 19 year old boys. He smoked cigarettes like a freight train. But he had so many other things going for him, he could overcome that. But if he did all these other things, pretty soon he couldn't keep up. So what I'm telling you is, if you're thirsty, if you're hungry, if you're looking for more, it's because Jesus doesn't have the proper place in your life. I would go on, but... I want to respect your time. So we'll, we'll, we, we'll um, pick back up in verse 36. Um, if you want to read 36, 37, 38 through 40, that's another dose of it's all God's work in salvation. It's not yours. Because in, in those verses, in the preview of next week, he says, I am keeping all the ones that the Father has given to me, and I won't lose even one of them. All that the Father draws, I get, and I don't lose one that I get. It's just just ironclad. It's right there. So that's a pill to chew on for next week, and we'll um, resume in 36 next week. Let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that you'd press it into our hearts. It's one thing to hear it, Lord. I pray we wouldn't dismiss your word. If I've said anything today that isn't proper, I pray that it would um, fall on deaf ears, that your word would be number one in each one of our lives because you are the true bread of life. We don't have to hunger and we don't have to thirst. And we all know that this world doesn't fill us up. This world doesn't do it for us. Um, So I pray that we would again let you, let your Holy Spirit search our hearts. If anything, as I've been speaking today, if anything has come up in our lives, Lord, something we know that's improper or something that we know that's been draining our joy or draining our peace or sapping our power, Lord, I pray that you would um, help us to repent of it. It's not just a a small thing, Lord. It's a sin, and we're missing the mark, and we're not being the witness and the testimony we're supposed to be. You have intended for each one of us
to live an abundant life. So I pray, Lord, that we would live that abundant life fully feeding on you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.